please. Our, our next speaker is Luke Roy from uh, University, Auburn University, uh, using an extension approach to address an emergency, emerging industry concern, a case study of winter fish losses in Arkansas. Thanks, Roy. All right, thanks, uh, Gary. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about an issue that uh, arose in 2013 when I was still at University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. And uh, uh, some of the co-authors on this study, all of us were at Pine Bluff when this happened, and, and a, a few of us have moved on to, to, to other positions uh, since then. But Arkansas is a leading producer of bait fish. Most of you guys are aware of this, uh, with about 16,000 acres in production. It's also a big producer of sport fish. And in the spring of 2013, uh, when farmers began to harvest their ponds, uh, pretty much almost all the farmers uh, in the state of Arkansas that were bait fish and many sport fish farmers uh, started observing that they didn't have quite as many fish as they, as they typically have. Uh, and the largest losses were being observed by farmers that, that were raising fathead minnows, golden shiners, and uh, centrarchids. Um, and so this information started filtering into Extension. Uh, they started calling us uh, at UAPB. Uh, these are the fish that they, they kind of said, hey, look, we're, we've lost an unusually large number uh, of these fish compared to past winters. And uh, we're very concerned about it because, uh, in some cases, uh, some of the farmers lost over 50% of their crop uh, uh, over the winter and, uh, and had to take out loans in order to survive. A couple of farms said, look, if this happens to me again, I'm done. Uh, so it was kind of a big deal. Uh, they, they requested the help of Cooperative Extension to kind of investigate this issue and to determine the extent of, of what the winter uh, losses actually were. Um, and uh, they also wanted us to explore different theories regarding winter fish losses. So what we did was, uh, like Extension sometimes do, is we developed a, a questionnaire. Uh, and we interviewed mostly in person 34 different Arkansas farmers uh, in June and July of 2013. Um, some of the results of the questionnaire, 79% of the farmers interviewed reported unusual winter fish losses. Uh, losses were catastrophic on some of the farms. And large numbers of uh, lesser scop, uh, which is a diving duck that, that shows up along the flyway as it migrates south during the winter, uh, there were a lot more of these ducks than, than usual. Um, we tabulated losses uh, that were uh, acquired uh, through this questionnaire, uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so unusual uh, losses, and by unusual losses, we're talking about more than uh, customary or more than expected were observed on over 7,000 acres that year, which is a huge amount. Uh, and if you look at the combined losses of fathead minnows and golden shiners, um, that accounted for 36% of the bait fish production in terms of water acres uh, in the state. So we knew we, we had a big problem. On the questionnaire, we also asked the farmers, hey, what are some of the things that you think might, might be going on? And uh, this is just a short list. Uh, the list is actually quite long. These are the ones that were kind of the most common and reoccurring extreme temperature fluctuations, uh, fish pr uh, feed prices really went up that year, so a lot of them didn't feed much that winter. Uh, there were drought conditions in the fall, uh, a lot more ducks. Uh, some of them suspected maybe some of the new fungicides that were coming out might have been a problem, and then uh, hydrogen sulfide. So all this happened uh, my first month on the job uh, at UAPB, uh, and Carol <laughs> called me in and said, hey, uh, you know, I know you all, you've only been here two weeks, but you need to take the lead on this. And, and Dr. Stone uh, said, if I solve this problem, they build a statue of me in Lone Oak. Uh, <laughs> they don't have they don't have the statue <laughs> yet, but Lone Oak's kind of in central in central uh, Arkansas, as you can kind of see. Most of the bait fish and uh, sport fish farms are kind of centered around that county. So. Uh, after meeting with the producers and lo looking at the data from the questionnaire, we had a, a meeting with uh, UAPB Extension Research Personnel, USDA APHIS Wildlife Services, and uh, USDA Stuttgart National Aquaculture Research uh, Center, and decided to, to approach it from two angles. Uh, we did a, a lesser scop study on the ducks, and then we did some winter feeding uh, trials, and so I'm going to talk about both of those. Um, this is just a picture of some uh, male and female scop on a pond. As you can see, uh, there's quite a few ducks that, that'll show up uh, over the winter. Uh, and, you know, some of the farmers were saying that they had uh, count, counted up to 10,000 of these on their farm at one time. Um, during duck season in December and January, they do have hunters that can kind of help 
uh, control the issue, but they're really kind of lost, uh, I guess, their shirt, so to speak, in February and March after hunting season when they no longer had any control. The countermeasures that were available were not effective. The uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service didn't allow a migratory bird, uh, such as a, a waterfowl uh, duck, uh, on, on their depredation permits. Uh, even though USDA Wildlife Services went and requested it, they denied the request and said if you looked into the literature, uh, and I did look in the literature as well, uh, most of the papers say that Scott barely eat fish and it was only about 10% at the most of their diet. So we know that uh, other birds, uh, this has been widely studied, do consume fish. Uh, the question was, uh, do, are scop eating fish and, and how much are they eating? So the objective of the, this first duck study was to obtain preliminary data to use as evidence to add lesser scop to depredation permits. And so to do this, we collected scop and examined them for the presence of whole fish and the weight of fish consumed uh, was quantified. We also looked for the presence of fish parts, bones and olus in the gizzard um, of the ducks. So I didn't go to a fisheries, uh, school of fisheries uh, at Auburn to do wildlife but, uh, of work, but I ended up having to do it on this particular case. We collected 220 scop in 2014 and 2015, the first year focused on bait fish. Uh, the second year we focused on sport fish. This is on my first day of collections uh, and uh, some of the scop that we collected uh, you can see the fish or, or hanging out of their mouths uh, uh, right off right off the get-go. Um, these these are a little some of these pictures are a little rough but this just is just a document put all this in the US Fish and Wildlife Service report uh, saying look uh, and we had to get permits because uh, scop are a protected species to do all this work to show them that look they are eating fish this is how much fish they're eating. We, we, we weighed them. Uh, the record was 26 bluegill found in one duck, but we found up to 19 golden shiners and 18 fathead minnows in, in ducks as well. So looking at the presence of whole fish and fish parts, we found that 10% uh, or 11% of the ducks had whole fish in them. And then when you looked in the gizzard, 40% uh, ha uh, had uh, fish parts in the, in the gizzard in the bait fish study. Uh, looking at the sport fish, it was even more, over 60% of, uh, of the ducks had whole fish in them, and over 80% had uh, fish parts uh, in the gizzard. So we know that lesser scop are consuming fish on commercial sport fish and bait fish farms, and these losses appear to be a significant loss of production and income to bait fish and sport fish farmers. So what we did was use this data, took it back to Fish and Wildlife Service, and they did agree to add lesser scop to uh, the depredation permit. So now they have some protection. So when they're trying to scare the birds, if they accidentally shoot one, they won't be in violation of a federal law. So that was kind of the goal of the project. Uh, we, you know, the farmers wanted a lot more than 25 on the permit. <laughs> they were hoping they could get maybe uh, 200, uh, but that, that didn't happen. Fish and Wildlife said 25 is what you're going to get. Uh, we did use this preliminary data uh, through USDA SRAC. Uh, to secure uh, a, a grant for almost 300000 to investigate the issue. Uh, and that, this project's ongoing uh, uh, through uh, Mississippi State, and Carol Ingalls doing the economics on it as well to, to look at the costs. So that was the first part of the study. We also did some winter feeding trials. And uh, for those of you that have raised fish, you know that sometimes survival of young of the year uh, A0 fish in the winter depends on a lot of different things. Uh, and which I have listed here. And we know uh, that winter feeding practices can also uh, have uh, an influence on uh, survival of fish. So the literature says that su survival rates of small fish are generally lower than for uh, larger fish. And fish that are uh, one to two inches in size need to feed over the winter in order to survive. Um, and small unfed fish actually suffer more during the winter sometimes when uh, the temperature is above four degrees Celsius because their food intake is not actually enough to cover resting metabolism. Uh, so uh, over the course of several years, uh, we did studies on seven different species of uh, fish. These are the ones that farmers lost the most over the winter, uh, uh, looking at uh, three different feed rates, feeding once a week, twice a week, or once a month at a constant low temperature. And uh, one of the things that the questionnaire revealed was that during that winter, there were a couple of farmers uh, or several farms that only fed three or four times over the entire course of the winter. They were feeding just once a month, even when temperatures were going up. 
So we wanted to see if we, we uh, using different feeding regimes, whether that would affect uh, the growth uh, or and survive, survival of the, the fish. Um, I want you to just focus on the on the weight uh, gain or in some cases loss just directly above the arrow. We didn't have any differences in survi and survival in this uh, particular study. But th this happened with the fathead minnows when they were fed twice a week. Uh, and this is what we expected. They actually grew a little bit over the winter. Uh, but then once a week and twice a week, uh, uh, excuse me, once a week and once a month, they, they lost weight and they, they lost the most weight at once a month. But this wasn't true in the case of the other six species that we looked at. If you look at the weight gain of the golden <laughs> shiners, regardless of the feeding regime that we used, all of them lost weight. We didn't have significant losses of weight, but all of them lost weight. And uh, <laughs> the Centrarca data is pretty interesting. And, and uh, we presented a lot of this stuff at USAS meetings the last few years, uh, study, looking at these individual studies that we did. But as you, as you can see here across the board, regardless of feeding regimes, uh, the Centrarc has lost a lot of weight. The hybrid bluegill seemed to be the most tolerant. They lost the least amount of weight. Uh, the readier sunfish uh, lost over 30% of their body weight across the board, even when fed uh, the different feeding regimes. So, um, and this is just kind of just a, a short picture of, the, the, of, of that data. But uh, at the temperatures examined in this study, all the centrarchids lost a huge uh, amount of body weight, regardless of their feeding regimes. And due to this, uh, we're recommending that producers try to fatten uh, the fish in the fall uh, before the temperature drops. Uh, and also uh, try to avoid late spawns if possible. Uh, you know, you try to run into the winter with a larger than three inch fish, but it, it doesn't always happen sometimes, especially the farmers that are relying on, on uh, late spawns have small fish going in the winter. And when you have small fish going in the winter, you need to take the necessary management steps to, to deal with the situation. So as far as bait fish, we are recommending that farmers feed once or twice per week uh, uh, as it may be uh, beneficial. So the problems that, that we were faced with in extension are diverse and often demand a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and this has kind of been emphasized in this meeting uh, several times by, by uh, in some of the different presentations that we've seen. And uh, also in extension, and I, I, I'm not sure if you guys feel this way, but often we're, we're forced to work in areas that are way outside of our comfort zone. And uh, with, the, with this duck study, uh, I was definitely out of my uh, comfort zone. Uh, I hadn't shot a duck. I, I do love the, the deer hunt, but I hadn't shot a really a, been duck hunting once before I got involved in this study. Uh, but we have to kind of adapt to serve our stakeholders, and that's just one of the things that as extension specialists uh, we, we have to do. All these studies were done on $3,000 and uh, donations of uh, by Remington Arms Company, which is in Lone Oak. They donated the shells uh, for the study, which we were happy. And then we did use some of our extension money. And then USDA, both SNARK and USDA Wildlife Services basically donated their time uh, because we weren't able to secure a grant. This was an emergency situation. We needed to get, get the work done fast. But we do know that money doesn't grow on trees and we have to aggressively <coughs> pursue uh, funding. It took three years and multiple submissions of, of grants to several agencies before funding was secured for this study. And I think that's probably a common problem uh, that we see in some of these iner emergency uh, issues. I, I am happy to see that USDA uh, NEFA does now have kind of that critical uh, uh, problem uh, uh, grant uh, source of money for 300 grand that can kind of address this, but still writing a grant takes time. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the, everybody who helped out with this study, uh, which were quite a few people. And uh, if we have any time for questions, I, I'd be happy to answer them. One question. Uh, in the the the, so the question was, you know, we've determined that f that uh, the the ducks are basically eating the bait fish. Can the farmers uh, shoot them? The, the the answer is they they can they can do two things. They they can shoot up to 25 of them, uh, but really that's kind of more for protection. That allows them to kind of scare them by shooting a gun in their direction. Uh, and so if they have a a pellet or something from their shotgun that actually didn't hit ones, then they, they, they won't be in violation. But the the depredation permit wasn't 
you know, intended to, to shoot fish. But one thing they can do is allow uh, hunters to, to lease their property and allow duck hunters to come in and control it for uh, the months of December and January. And in that case, yeah, the, the farmers can take, uh, uh, they can shoot four scot per day on their hunting license, or the, the hunters could take, you know, three to four per day. Uh, so that's the option. It, it's not the best situation, but it's, it's kind of what they're, they're faced with right now. Thank you. Appreciate it.